John Galliano's namesake label was rough. It never truly turned a profit, it was regularly questioned by critics, and was on more than one occasion a total flop. But despite all of that, it was once legendary and took the man behind it to the height of the fashionable world. At least that is until his whole world came crashing down. Many consider Galliano's first collection to be his 1984 graduate collection from Central St. Martins. However, this really wasn't intended to be the beginning of a career. In fact, Galliano didn't want to be a fashion designer at all and instead actually wanted to be a fashion illustrator. Truly, if it wasn't for his professors at Central St. Martins convincing him to turn his illustrations into physical garments, this revered collection would never have happened at all. For the collection, he took inspiration from a historical group of arrogant and stylistically outrageous people in Paris called, for women, Les Merveilleux, and for men, Les Incroyables, from whom the collection gained its name. He sketched the collection by candlelight for authenticity and was helped by many friends, including a very young Hamish Bowles, who helped sew on buttons. On the day, there were three presentations of the students' work, with Galliano taking up the final spot in the catwalk show a spot traditionally held for the strongest collection. However, not even the professors could have expected the public reaction that the collection garnered. After the first showing of the day was exceptionally well received, the second and third became overflowed with people fighting to get seats. Overnight, he went from a simple student to the hottest designer in London and found himself catapulted into a business for which he was very much unprepared. You see, as the show came to a close, many big players in fashion came to meet John backstage, including Joan Burstein, the owner of Brown's, a store in London that was known to support young designers in interesting design. Burstein burst through the backstage area and purchased the entire collection from Galliano on the spot so she could sell it in her esteemed boutique, where the collection sold exceptionally well, perhaps because he was featured so prominently in the window. For this reason, to keep a good thing going, Burstein then advanced money to Galliano so that he could go and buy more fabric to make more of the collection for sale at Brown's, all of which continued to sell extremely well, despite him literally having no infrastructure and making all of these pieces on his kitchen table with his friends. So, right from the beginning, Galliano showed both a creative ability and a commercial talent as well, meaning his career was off to a roaring start. He was quickly contacted by Amanda Grieve, who you probably know from her marital name, Lady Amanda Harlock, who commissioned Galliano to make the cover for Malcolm McLaren's album, Madame Butterfly, which subsequently began a wonderfully long working relationship between Amanda and John. However, John, here pictured in his graduate photo, still was not convinced that he wanted to be a designer at all. Most designers in this position would be seeking out a financial backer in order to produce more collections, but John was completely unfazed and hadn't remotely started to look. Instead, he'd actually accepted a job as an illustrator in New York, apparently totally unaware of what a gifted beginning his career had had. And yet, it was a beginning that was only about to get better. When Johan Brunn, a 24-year-old from Denmark with a fashion boutique in Copenhagen, was on a trip to London, he became mesmerized by the Brown's shop window of John's graduate collection. He ventured inside the store to check out what was on offer and found more than he bargained for as he was informed that Galliano himself was present in the shop. He proceeded to try to make an order, but John declined, telling him that he could barely produce enough to keep Brown stocked, and besides, he'd just accepted this job as an illustrator in New York, so he wasn't interested in producing any more than this collection. Nevertheless, the very wealthy businessman purchased a coat for £400, which was the equivalent to about 80% of a monthly average wage at the time, and left with John's home telephone number. A few weeks later, Johan would follow up, but instead of reaching John, he reached his sister, who unbeknownst to her, planted a seed in Johan's mind. She told him that there had been so much interest in his product, but without a backer, the John Galliano label just could not continue. Immediately, Johan agreed to bankroll the company, and so on a verbal agreement only, the John Galliano Brunn Limited Company was begun with £3,000 in backing. With this financing, he was able to buy fabric, find a studio, hire experienced staff, 
and develop his first label, which featured the iconic John Galliano font, as well as what was supposed to be a rendition of his family crest, but is more just a translation of his name into images. After only four months, their first collection together was Spring Summer 85, and featured a lot of similarities to the graduate collection. It had a similar price point, it again featured rather difficult to wear, historically inspired garments, and stylistically for the time, it again contrasted the very simple but commercially successful Milanese style that was in fashion at the time. As a result, the show was such an enormous success, orders in the region of £44,000 were taken, and they were even able to turn away some prospective buyers in order to retain a luxury brand positioning, proving to be an amazing return on investment for Johan. By the following season, or to winter 85, Galliano's show was the hottest ticket of the whole Fashion Week season, not least because they had hired Jean Bennett to do the PR, who had Galliano featured in a plethora of magazines between seasons. Therefore, on the day of the show, as a result, they had every fashion editor wanting to go, as did countless other members of the public. A huge crowd of people built up outside the venue to the effect that a wide quantity of people would have to be turned away including many annoyed editors, buyers, and critics, forcing the company to have a second showing later that day so that they didn't miss out on the sales. But despite the mess that was attendance, critically, the collection, once again, was really successful, except for one review by Bill Cunningham drawing major similarities between Galliano and Vivian Westwood, who herself actually loved the collection. And because of the new edition of knitwear, as well as some more simple shirts, the collection also turned out to be relatively financially successful as well, despite the many unwearable garments in the collection that were impossible to be viable commercially, meaning they only made £66,000, only just turning a profit as their costs had risen. However, these collections weren't planned to be commercial. In fact, Galliano cared very little for what would actually sell in retail, opting to put more emphasis on the creative side of his business. This would really come back to haunt him for the following collection, Spring Summer 86, that was nowhere near as revered as his previous works. The collection, despite retailing for around the same price point, if a little bit cheaper, just did not see the same amount of critical or commercial acclaim. In fact, it was his first show that was fairly widely panned, which obviously had a knock-on effect on sales. This is because, for the show's finale, which I cannot show you on YouTube, but is available on my Patreon that's linked below if you're interested in early access to videos, the female models appeared wearing diaphanous muslin empire line dresses that were drenched with tepid water backstage in order to make them stick to the body transparently. This was another historic fashion reference to the Merveilleux, who he referenced in his graduate collection, but instead of being used to draw a through line between collections, it was specifically only used in order to shock the audience. Shock it did, but just not necessarily in a good way. Similarities were again drawn between Galliano and Vivian Westwood, and the press were quick to point out that the Vivian Westwood pattern cutter, Mark Tarbard, and her cobbler Patrick Cox now worked for Galliano, in a way that made it seem like Galliano's label was Diet Westwood. And yet, while Vivian Westwood still had her own very successful business and a slew of loyal customers in order to encourage this kind of design, Galliano did not. And so as fashion trends swayed back to the more wearable mainstream classics, the collection just did not seem commercially viable or desirable whatsoever due to the very few wearable elements. Meaning that despite his now well-acknowledged talent, the collection financially was a flop. The scarcity of orders also caused concern with his financial backer, Johan Brunn, who so far, due to the commercial success, had been able to overlook some of the many problems that they were having with the clothes, including, but not limited to, the garments being so avant-garde that they were a hard sell to retailers, the clothes not fitting the customers well because Galliano insisted on fitting them to himself, which meant that 60-70% to 70 of their stock didn't sell, the clothes being so complicated that they often missed delivery dates, so either annoyed the buyers or meant that the orders had to be cancelled completely, losing the company money. The fact Galliano designed inconsiderate of through lines, so customers had no hook to bring them back to the next season, causing customer sales to be unpredictable. 
and also the issue that with all of these problems, the costs were continually rising, being that regardless of how well the collection sold, they still had rent, wages and production costs to cover, each increasing with each passing season as Galliano needed more workers and more space. Brun was not happy. Galliano was an incredible creative talent, but he was not a businessman. What they really needed was a manager, as there wasn't anyone there to oversee the commercial side of the business, and frankly to tell Galliano how to appease customers and buyers in order to keep food on the table. Or at least, there was no one that he would actually listen to. Consequently, the relationship between Galliano and Brun severely deteriorated, and the atmosphere in the studio suffered with their obvious dislike for each other. Galliano even started telling Brun that if he did not want to create art, then fashion was not for him. While Brun still held all the money and was demanding a more commercial collection from the designer. Despite their relationship, Galliano did try to appease him in Autumn Winter 86, but frankly, he didn't deliver. The press didn't like the collection and it didn't even sell well. The fabric choices were uncomfortable and impractical, as well as ridiculously expensive, with dresses costing $700, which would have been equal to a whole monthly wage at the time. Brun, now at the end of his patience, literally as the show came to a close, decided to liquidate the business after only four collections. On the advice of his lawyer, Brun refused to pay the models in their promised clothes, refused to release the collection commercially, and soon after straight up locked Galliano out of the studio, leaving all of his work inside, though Galliano and his friends did later manage to break in to reclaim it all. So, the show happened in February, Galliano was locked out by March, and on June 24th, they released a statement saying it was a mutual departure. Brun lost £47,000 from that collection alone, and a further £33,000 was owed by John Galliano Brun Limited to manufacturers that were simply never paid. So, the company was down and out. But Galliano himself wasn't ready to give up just yet. He set up appointments with the Armani team for backing, but that fell through, and instead he set his sights on a new backer called Peter Bertelsen of Agucheek, who was another Danish man that had a successful business background, this time in oil and property development, but now was turning his attention to fashion. It was known around town that Bertelsen was already looking to attract press attention for his ever-growing portfolio, as well as to capture the trendy Browns clientele. So on paper, Galliano was the perfect match. A deal was announced on the 1st of July, with Galliano cutting menswear from the next collection, Spring Summer 87, to design exclusively for women, which Bertelsen had made clear had to be very wearable and void of superfluous expensive details. This is really where their differences began. Bertelsen wanted something that would be financially stable right from the word go, which is almost never the way that it happens with fashion, and he wanted classic women's wear, but from a designer that neither did that, nor that he could understand the creativity of. Despite this, Galliano's first collection under Bertelsen, Spring Summer 87, actually sold really well. The prices were significantly more accessible than previously, with skirts about £60, jersey top at £45, and silk blouses between £75 and £85. This was also the first use of the bias cut, which would go on to be the major signifier of the whole of Galliano's career, and actually included Naomi Campbell's modelling debut, where in this interview she claimed that her skirt fell off. Large orders were placed by Browns, Harrods and Whistles in London, and the press as well was favourable towards the collection. Galliano stuck to Bertelsen's brief, and it paid off. Bertelsen had given him a sales target of £100,000 for the collection, which he achieved easily, convincing Bertelsen to extend the contract to five years. Within this contract, for the first two years, sales doubled season on season. He became the star of the Agucheek parent company and was once again at the forefront of fashion. By spring-summer 88, John Galliano's orders quadrupled and turnover was the largest in the entire parent company, with sales throughout Europe, Japan and North America exceeding expectations. However, while John Galliano was doing well, Agucheek was not. By the end of 1987, they had 13 million in liabilities and were only making 11.9 million in annual sales across all of their brands. Frankly, 
This was because Bertelsen didn't understand the fashion industry. He came in with large investments, but didn't know how to invest them for the long term. Expecting fashion houses, like other areas of business, such as oil and property that he was in previously, to turn a profit almost immediately and then consistently, which has never and has never been the case in the fashion industry. Meanwhile, because of the ridiculous success of the Spring Summer 88 collection, it seems that Galliano's design was becoming cocky. Through this time, he'd been pushing for the design to become more and more creative, more conceptual, and less commercial. And that's why, in the Autumn Winter 88 collection, they completely dismissed all of the wants of the buyers to produce a foolish collection that sold far less well than hoped. Galliano began to feel like his creativity was being stunted by the need to be commercial. But really, he was only concerned with the show and the advertising, still not caring for the commercial side at all. All in all, he was lucky that his brand name carried such weight at this time, because without it, it's unlikely stores would have taken the collection at all. Even his sales team said that the stores took the collection only because they needed a Galliano presence in order to keep themselves looking relevant. They didn't like the collection, but they needed it for their own brand in a way like an anchor store acts for a mall. By spring summer 89, the press was turning hostile against Galliano. The parent company were discontented with the sales figures falling, as well as the high cost of production, and it once again pulled into question the viability of the designer for them as investors. Autumn Winter 89 was also a commercial and critical flop, but more importantly, the parent company Agucheek was continuing its ever-growing financial trouble and were forced to shed all of their other fashion businesses to focus on the now-failing but potential full Galliano label. Unfortunately though, this turned out not to be fruitful. Spring Summer 90, despite being the capital debut of Kate Moss, was also a flop, and the brand tried to release a swimwear line, but because of Galliano's wild design reputation, it just didn't find many buyers at all. Meanwhile, a man named Stephen Robinson, who is widely disliked, had begun at Galliano, where he gatekept John from the other workers and started taking advantage of Galliano's alcohol addiction which eventually led to Anna Wintour trying to step in to send him to rehab, though that was undermined by Robinson, who smuggled John whiskey. This affected the main line quite heavily. And by autumn into 90, the company was looking pretty desperate. They decided to show in Paris because of the recession in England, and to keep costs down, they looked for a sponsor, which came in the form of Warner Brothers, who had them include Bugs Bunny in the collection in trade for some cash. Finally, they had a hit. The design returned to truly commercial pieces, heightened with good styling, so subsequently sold well across Europe, Japan, and to a lesser extent, America. It was never that they didn't have customers that wanted to buy the clothes, it's just they couldn't find anything they wanted, with this collection being evidence of that. They managed to continue this success with the Spring Summer 91 collection that would also be extremely well received critically, However, once again, after seeing some success in the previous collection, John had just gone back to his avant-garde nature, dismissing all the wants of the consumer. He didn't seem to understand the need for a balance between commercial and critical success at all. So, despite the huge uptake in sales after beginning to show in Paris, overall the collection was really challenging, expensive, and exactly the opposite of what the parent company wanted. Bertelsen was not happy. He began stunting his own brand's successful collection, seemingly just out of spite. By delaying payments to suppliers, the fabric wasn't available on time, so the orders were unfulfilled, damaging very much needed connections. Then, to further this behavior, despite finally now having two well-received collections, both critically and somewhat commercially, Bertelsen refused to pay for the next Autumn Winter 91 collection until Galliano agreed to start working on two cheaper diffusion lines, Galliano Girl and Galliano Jeans. But the execution was poor, the range was narrow, the colour palette was very difficult, and simply sportswear, which was the plan for Galliano Girl, just didn't fit the Galliano vibe. The jeans did sell okay in Japan, Italy and Britain, but Galliano Girl was a real tactical mistake for the time period, 
one only made worse by Bertelsen's insistence on keeping it. By this point, Bertelsen had pretty much stopped funding the mainline shows, so Galliano needed financing if he didn't want to miss a second season in a row. Though this time, he found partial funding fairly quickly in a London-based shoe brand called Shelley's, who would pay for over half the cost of the show. While Azadina Laya agreed to let him use half of his showroom for buyers after the show, and through a mutual friend he was introduced to Fake Moore, who funded the fabrics and the fabrication, as he owned a very large manufacturing facility that dealt with high fashion. However, the resulting Spring Summer 92 collection was pretty negatively reviewed, because despite the large quantity of looks, it consisted of very few actual garments due to most of the models being only dressed in underwear. As a result, the collection did not sell well, and even to the most loyal client, it was simply too extreme. This was the final straw for Bertelsen, who ended up officially withdrawing the financing from John Galliano, though he did continue to produce Galliano jeans because it still had £100,000 in sales per season and had low cost for Bertelsen because he owned the licensing company that made the jeans. Once again, John needed a new backer. But this time, it was much easier found than before, after his now friend, Fake Moore, agreed to go into business with Galliano and finance his collections at two Demi Couture collections per year, as well as the diffusion line Galliano Girl, while Amour would do the marketing, manufacturing, management and distribution until Galliano could find a permanent backer, which Amour also agreed to help him try to find. This ultimately would prove to be a phenomenal decision, as the Demi Couture Spring Summer 93 collection was an enormous hit. The garments were exceptionally well made thanks to Amour's factory, very wearable and yet creative, sending the audience into rapture over the incredibly theatrical presentation. This collection was such an incredible success that it finally received the attention of major couture clients, as well as Anna Wintour herself, who, according to Andrew Leon Talley's book, actually purchased some pieces and began to feature Galliano in Vogue. But, despite it being an enormous critical success, the sales figures didn't reflect this, and despite not wanting to, Amour had to pull out of being Galliano's financial backer, which was always the plan and they did manage to remain friends. Actually, they did stay in business for a while after he said that he was going to pull the plug, as thanks to Amour's diligence, Galliano had finally registered his name for trademark in a 50-50% split of the company with Amour back when he agreed to finance the company. But, due to the sales and because they just couldn't find a permanent financial backer or buyer for Amour's shares of the company, Galliano, unfortunately, therefore, did not make an autumn winter collection that year. And because of the ridiculous success in the previous collection, his absence was really noted. And so Amour, once again, agreed to finance most of the next collection, with additional financing found in customers, Sal Schlumbacher, Madame Boutin, and Mrs. Dodi Rosecran, who, little did they know, were about to fund the single most influential collection in his career so far. The Spring Summer 94 collection was based on 19th century Russian Tsarinas rushing from the Winter Palace during the Revolution, only to end up in the Scottish Highlands. It was both commercial, technically incredible, and creatively thrilling. Large orders were placed by Barney's, Bergdorf Goodman, Ultimo in Chicago, Maxfield's in LA, and Joseph and Brown's in London. It was by far the most discussed show in all of the fashion season, and saw John inducted as a member to the Chambre Syndicale de la Couture, meaning that he could star his own couture house, though of course he lacked the financial means to do so. Meanwhile, Amour, who was still Galliano's friend, agreed to produce all the many orders for Galliano from this collection, as he otherwise really didn't have any other kind of infrastructure to fulfill these massive orders. In fact, now with that collection done, Galliano was, once again, without a financial backer, and could in no way afford to even buy fabric, let alone finance a whole collection himself. Amour, yet again, really was the one to step in to help. Galliano had pretty much bankrupted Amour at this point, and yet they still went to see everyone all over Paris trying to find him financing. 
including LVMH, Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy, who politely declined, saying that they weren't interested in creators of this sort. Amour genuinely had done everything he could. He tried so hard to make the Galliano business viable, but he continued to run into all of the same issues that the many backers before him had discovered. So, now at the end of his tether, he wrote to Anna Wintour for help. She never responded to the letter, but instead simply sent Galliano a coach-grade ticket to New York, where she provided him a hotel on Vogue's dime and set him up in parties and dinners to get him some much-needed exposure to potential backers and even directly set him up with meetings with the Wertheimers, who are the brothers that own Chanel, meetings with Payne Weber Investments Chairman John Bolt, and Mark Rice, associate of Spencer Communications, all in the hopes of finding him a backer, though none actually came through. At least, not until André Leon Talley bombarded Bolt and Rice with every Galliano press report and video that he could get his hands on, until they acquiesced to meet with the designer in Paris. After the meeting, they agreed to back the company for 50,000 US dollars, as long as they owned 75% of the company. The Galliano line was dropped, and that the following collection would remain very small. They agreed, of course, and the collection produced was Autumn Winter 94, named Black, and was THE infamous collection that Galliano showed in Sao Schlumbacher's house. In Andre Leon Talley's book, he describes how everything was done for Galliano for free to try to make Galliano's company viable. The shoes, the hats, the models, the location, the diamonds were all provided to Galliano for free and the entire Vogue staff worked tirelessly to make the collection THE must-see for the season. Comprising of only 18 looks, the excitement for this collection surpassed anything the brand had seen before, and on the morning of the show, a queue began to form outside of Schlumbacher's house at 8.30am, requiring André Leon Talley himself to gate-check invitations at the door. The critical reaction was immediate and explosive. Both the press and the buyers adored it. The sales were enormous from all over the world, and it meant his new financial backers were genuinely very pleased with their investment. Their test to see if they should go into business with Galliano was a no-brainer. They immediately set up a studio and organized logistics for the company that was 75% owned by Bolton Rice and 25% owned by Galliano with Bolton Rice buying out Amour in full, and 25% of Galliano's shares with the agreement that Galliano would earn his name rights back once they broke even on their investment. They then put John on a salary of 25,000 francs per month, all of his business expenses were covered, and everyone was more than happy in this deal. But, because the collection was so obviously defining, it raised the question of if he would be able to repeat such an enormous success for spring summer 95. Of course, we know now that not only did he repeat the success, but he expanded on it with one of his most commercially and critically acclaimed collections ever, thanks in most part to this pin-up suit that even with the price tag of £1,960 was the biggest hit item of the season commercially, with the original that cost £3,545 being flown across the globe to be used in a wide range of promotional media. Both Liberties and Barneys had waiting lists for this suit alone, and for good reason. It was lightweight, comfortable and practical, and even Linda Evangelista said that the finale yellow tour ball gown was her favourite dress of all time. Galliano was once again a creative powerhouse in the industry, but he had now finally proved to be commercially capable too meaning that the big brands started to see him as a viable candidate for their top positions, especially Bernard Arnault, who had been looking to spice up the LVMH portfolio, which, though was mildly profitable, Arnault saw great potential in by reformatting couture to be used as marketing for things like bags, shoes and accessories, which would be sold to the mid-masses. In short, together with Galliano, Bernard Arnault would reformat the whole of couture to be the couture format that we have today. Galliano's brand of theatricality was obviously perfect for this. However, Stephen still very much had Galliano under his thumb, 
and Galliano was still personally dealing with alcohol abuse, making him very easy to take advantage of. So, seeing this as an excuse to get rid of Amanda Harlock, the only person to be able to stand up against Stephen, she was not included on the list of people to become salaried by Givenchy. This would have been a huge smite concocted by Stephen, but Bolt and Rice stepped in, seeing her value, and unbeknownst to her, saved her from being ousted. By January 1995, having already signed his Givenchy contract, and yet despite Givenchy not wanting to release the information before Hubert de Givenchy's final collection, it was leaked to the press that Galliano would be the designer to take over. Unfortunately for Hubert, this really overshadowed his final farewell to his namesake company, hence why LVMH didn't want to release this information. But for the Galliano business, it now meant that if his financial backers pulled out for now the sixth time, he could afford to back it himself with their $230,000 per collection deal that saw him produce four collections. So it was almost a million dollars per year, far more than enough to keep his company afloat if needed something that was likely in the back of his mind, as the previous two collections, Autumn Winter 95 and Spring Summer 96, were only satisfactorily sold despite positive public response. His debut at Givenchy was Autumn Winter 96, and to keep the John Galliano line and the Givenchy line separate, he would design for Givenchy in Paris and Galliano in London. But now without financial fears, the Galliano brand returned to his really creative works that just weren't as viable commercially as he had previously been requested to be. Yet, despite this year not being the company's finest commercially, it was very desirable to the big luxury parent companies because of how critically successful Galliano was. It was thought that an acquisition of the John Galliano brand could bring in that youth factor that is so needed by the huge companies like LVMH who in September 1996 would purchase 62.5% of the company from Bolt and Rice, leaving them with 12.5% and Galliano with his full 25% remaining. Though later, Bolt, Rice and Galliano sold most of their remaining stakes to LVMH, with Galliano owning less than 10%. It therefore made sense that following Gianfranco Ferre's disappointing run at the house, which for more info on I do have a video on Dior, Galliano would be the one to replace him. But shockingly, Amanda Harlock would not go with him. Stephen got his way, and Harlock was left out in the rain. Galliano didn't even warn her, he simply didn't care. Really, on a personal level, it was just very heartless, but not necessarily unexpected, as he had begun to become quite cruel to those around him. Meanwhile, for the businesses, Galliano would now design for both. Dior, starting autumn into 97, with six collections per year, and John Galliano line for two, while Francois Beaufumé would be in charge of the business and Valerie Herman would be managing director, all in a new, much larger premises, en 60 rue d'Avron. This really set up the John Galliano line as an unofficial Dior subsidiary or diffusion line in the eyes of consumers, especially after so many elements from the John Galliano line were now being used in Dior. The bias cut dress that had been a Galliano staple starting spring 87 had been his first look shown for the Dior brand in autumn winter 97. In spring summer 01, Galliano would use newspaper print for the first time in his namesake label, which called back to autumn winter 2000 when Dior showed the print in a more commercial manner. In spring summer 01, both Dior and Galliano used the same models, the same location, and even in the Galliano show, the Dior catwalk was used on screens as well, and he even used the Miss Dior print on John Galliano brand t-shirts. So there was a lot of crossover between the two to encourage this mentality from consumers. But it's not that the John Galliano line was cheaper or worse made, because it wasn't. It had less facilities, sure, so there was less intricate work like embroidery, but mostly it was down to the fact that they had less brand impact than a name like Dior, and so to the average customer, Dior held more value, meaning that the Galliano line just read as secondary. However, at Dior, Arno didn't care if his couture sold, meaning that his designs didn't really need to be commercial, as the plan was to just use his talent as promotion to sell the high margin perfumes, cosmetics, and accessories. While at the John Galliano label, he really had to sell 
if this venture was to be viable. But because Galliano did not necessarily have a consistent thread throughout all of his work, his collection's commercial successes were dependent on each individual show's good public reception, which meant that ultimately his brand continued to be very difficult for buyers and very turbulent in terms of sales in general. Despite this, LVMH claimed that they had very strong growth since the acquisition, which could be attributed to expansion in most areas, though predominantly in the US, which at this point was responsible for 35% of sales. However, in reality, this was likely propped up with licensing deals that I believe began in the Givenchy era, but really expanded during the LVMH Dior era. Saying that, this focus on America had been planned from the beginning. Starting with introducing American stockists to John as the head of Givenchy, even before Dior was announced, creating their first pre-spring summer collection in 1997, their first in-store boutique launched in 1997 in the ever-supportive Bergdorf Goodmans, they introduced a Galliano X Dior fur line named Galliano Fur in February 1998 that was short-lived, introduced Galliano bags in December 1999, which I could not find an image of the very first bag, and this one I'm sure came in 2001, John Galliano started to produce pre-collections, upping his workload even further, and they began pushing growth in Asia as well, meaning that the design now had to consider a wider range of customers, all of which produced on top of an added pressure to compete with high street brands who would have new clothes on a weekly basis. So with all of this, finally, the Galliano label was doing genuinely well. Not because of Galliano, because as I said, apart from overseeing the design of the show, he had basically left it out to dry, but because of managing director Valerie Herman, who, along with the team, fixed all of the Galliano brand issues of bad fitting clothes while upping the quality of the product, meaning that by autumn winter 98, Galliano claimed sales were up 137% and their buying power up 40%. Though this did come at the cost of creativity, because as Galliano had unofficially left, the garments had become increasingly more commercial. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it certainly came at the loss of John caring about his namesake. However, this wasn't to last. By 2007, sales of Galliano were down, and in their biggest market, the US, they no longer had a single retailer for the mainline, including Bergdorf Goodman, who had always been so supportive. And across the world, they had only presence in Qatar. Saying that, by 2010, Galliano as a company still boasted 50 points of sale worldwide, but this was mostly for their new-ish diffusion line Galliano that targeted younger people with garish logo-driven designs. To quote Gods and Kings, a book that full disclaimer I was gifted but is genuinely brilliant anyway, it was like high fashion Abercrombie which frankly is how fashion companies go when there is a lack of a balance between creative and commercial, especially now that Stephen, the man that had been controlling Galliano all this time, had died and Galliano was in a deep depression about it, leaving the company completely on their own. By 2010, Galliano was relying on a large supply of drugs to keep him working on the ever-growing list of requirements from LVMH and from his own namesake label that saw him now creating 32 collections per year. He was a creative genius, but he was deeply anxious and addicted to alcohol and pills, yet he couldn't successfully delegate his work because no one had his handwriting. Meanwhile, he hadn't worked enough on branding for his namesake to be able to have a team that could recreate a Galliano look easily, meaning that he began to regularly get very harsh critiques that they were just rehashing old ideas. Which is true, that's exactly what they were doing. This is when the infamous Galliano anti-Semitic rant would surface online, and Galliano, who had once been the poster child for Paris Couture, became now the most hated man in fashion. He was arrested on February 4th, 2011, and was eventually fired from Dior after massive public pressure. However, not only was he fired from Dior, but also his own namesake brand. Galliano at this point only owned 8% of the company, while Dior owned 92 so to the parent company, he was a liability to his own name. His last show for his namesake, Autumn Winter 11, actually showed after he was fired, taking place on the 6th of March 2011. However, 
John Galliano, the business, would not be shuttered. Instead, in spring-summer 12, John was succeeded by the incredible Bill Gayton, who had been with the brand since spring-summer 85 as a machinist and had been Galliano's right-hand man ever since, or at least as close to that as one could get with Stephen gatekeeping John. Luckily for Gayton, unlike at Dior, he found a stride at Galliano, with Stephen Jones, also a long-time collaborator, being put in charge of John Galliano accessories. But truly, it seems the company was only kept open because of licensing deals that at least kept the brand breaking even, despite them continuing to not be profitable. This was then even worsened by the 2013 bankruptcy of their licensor, Etier, which meant that though they still showed, I can't imagine that they even broke even at this point. But that didn't stop them from trying. They adopted a new logo and a new label to try to push an evolution for the brand, and around the same time they switched up their collection format in men's spring summer 16 to a lookbook format, potentially just to cut back on costs. From here, the collections and their licensed products like scarves became easily discoverable in TK Maxx, or at least I saw a lot of it in TK Maxx personally, and the collections slowly became more and more commercial. Their last collection shown on a catwalk format was Spring Summer 19, and seemingly from here they've just turned into a merch line if I'm honest. They rely heavily on archive looks, things like the newspaper print, and they have a lot of high margin items like sportswear, shoes, sunglasses, all of those sorts of things. In fairness, it is actually done really well. Creatively, it's so much better than the Karl Lagerfeld namesake brand, and I do attribute that to Bill Gayton, who must have an encyclopedic knowledge of John Galliano's work, considering he started there in 1984 for Spring Summer 85. But unfortunately, the requirement to make it profitable has reduced Bill's creative work into relying on the Galliano name to sell just simple product, which is a shame despite how understandable it is. After this, it's really continued to devolve into where the brand is now, though I do want to be fair to the team there, because despite having to include high margin, painfully commercial garments that consistently repeat the same signifiers, actually they're producing a great version of that. There's a great amount of interesting elements like the newspaper print on the underside of shoes, but it is still a total shell of what it once was seemingly slowly having lost financing for flexible creativity over time. The John Galliano brand was never profitable, really, but it was once great. Because of that, it still has an enormous amount of equity. Galliano is still a very well-respected designer, having made a bit of a comeback since the anti-Semitic rant, so there's 100% potential there to make something of the brand in the future, which is my best guess as to why it hasn't been shuttered yet. Actually, honestly, I'd consider the brand to be a bit of a sleeping beauty in the industry, if I'm honest. It has such a strong brand name, and people don't seem to remember too many of the codes or details from the house, so they can easily be rewritten by a good designer and marketing team combo. Really, at this point, all they need to do, it seems, if they do want to turn it around, is inject the required huge injection of money, plan a decent marketing strategy, and give a designer, maybe even Bill, true creative freedom to make it a truly great creative expression once again. Then, with time, the brand certainly has the ability to return, though I personally don't know if it will happen while John is alive. And of course, that is all dependent on if LVMH doesn't shut it down first. Thank you so much for watching. Subscribe and hit the bell to see more videos like this one. Check out my beauty channel for videos like this, but about beauty brands, and check out my Patreon for early access.